welcome to uh, the Eurogen webinar program. Um, uh, I'm Michelle Batty, I'm the manager of Eurogen, which is the European reference network for rare urogenital diseases and complex conditions. Um, the Eurogen webinar program aims at sharing information with healthcare professionals on rare or highly complex conditions and we cover the paediatric congenital urogenital malformations, complex functional urology requiring highly specialised surgery and also rare urogenital cancers. Um, we're really delighted to have today uh, here with us uh, Dr John Hirsakers. Um, he's head of the Functional Urology and Neurology Unit at Radboud University Medical Centre in Nijmegen in the Netherlands and uh, he's an active member of all the major scientific societies. And moreover, he's the disease area coordinator for complicated and complex pelvic floor disorders for Eurogen. Um, he's a busy man because he's also the research lead for functional uh, urogenital conditions in, in Eurogen. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, I'll just highlight as well one of the services that Eurogen offers. If you're out there and as a healthcare professional you would like to seek the advice of the network, um, we're here to provide highly specialised advice from several experts located in different healthcare providers across Europe, all in uh, major high volume centres dealing with these conditions many, uh, many times and we're happy to help if you would like advice. So without further ado, I'll hand over to John. And once again, John, thank you so much for doing this and investing the time, and uh, we're really happy to have you. Um, please take the floor. Thank you, Mich thank you Michelle and Darren. I hope that you can see me. Um, I can see myself, so that's that's a good start. And uh, what I'm going to do with you today is that I share some clinical experiences in how to deal with a vesicle vaginal fistula, closing it from the vaginal side, and other vaginal surgery, including a huge uh, vaginal mass and also urethral diverticula. I will go to my presentation now. If you have questions, you can use the chat function and then the questions will be picked up by Darren and handed over to me and then I will try to answer that. As Michelle was saying, it's about one hour that we uh, will have this webinar, uh, depending a bit on how quick I go. And I try to do it in a way that it is um, um, clear for you what we do in clinical practice. This is not about science, it's about how to do uh, clinical practice. So, this is the first slide with a, with a title on it. Um, it is, as I said, about uh, three surgical procedures uh, vaginally for fistula, vaginal mass, and the urethral diverticulum. I don't have any conflict of interest, and we will start with the vesicle vaginal fistula. So, how should we assess and how should we treat this? Well, quite often, the cause of a vesicle vaginal fistula is very uh, clear in, uh, in our part of the world. And that, with that, I mean Western Europe. It is mostly um, after hysterectomy, and we don't have the fistulae uh, in our countries uh, like they exist, for instance, in Africa, where they uh, are hugely uh, caused by uh, deliveries. We have mostly the fistulas after hysterectomy, and that means. Uh, that it's a different approach. The fistula are not, well, quite often not that damaging as you can see after deliveries. So what we have is mostly a lady that is leaking uh, vaginally uh, with urine um, and that is mostly occurring about one to two weeks after the hysterectomy. In the beginning, there is edema of the surgical site of the hysterectomy and that means that uh, the tissues cover up the fistula and after a week it becomes clear that something is wrong meaning leakage so what do we do with that how do we assess it 
Well, the history is quite often very clear. What we do mostly is uh, uh, urethrocystoscopy to assess the urethra, to assess the bladder, and also to look at uh, the, um, the, the, the configuration of the fistula and the location, but especially with respect to the both uh, ureters. And what we always do in our practice is we make an MRI in order to find out how the tract of the fistula is running. And that is not to be um, uh, um, well requested to deal with uh, with surprises that you don't want. So what do we do with fistula repair? And this is a slide I borrowed from Professor De Ridder from Leuven. What we should do is identify the fistula. We have to gain access uh, and the exposures to the fistula, and that can quite be challenging. Then we have to incise, dissect, and mobilize the tissues around the fistula. Finally, we have to close it, and then continence should be there again. And we have to look at post-operative care, which is not a big issue in our world with our kind of fistulae. So how to identify the fistula? Well, if you look at this picture, and I hope you can see my mouse, um, you see that the catheter that is put into the meatal of the urethra is running through the urethra in the bladder. And what you can see here clearly, you can see the catheter again. It means that the fistula is here, but it's not always that obvious. So if we see it, well, that's something that, uh, that we recognize, and then we know that the fistula is there, but we also have to look at other uh, issues like what is the location? Well, you can see it's in the area of the bladder neck. What is the size? In this case, quite a heavy one, but this is most likely after the delivery. Is the urethra involved? Perhaps yes, in this case. Is there scar tissue? I don't think so, if I look at this. How about the ureters? We don't know yet, in this case. And what about the posterior wall of the bladder? Well, we don't know yet, just by looking at it. For that, we have to do more. But if you have identified the fistula, and I come back to that later, then you have to gain access and exposure to the fistula. In our areas, that is not the easiest thing to do because the fistula are mostly at the vaginal top, and then directly you have to decide whether you can go up high into the vagina to close the fistula, whether you can really have access to it, or whether you have to go, for instance, uh, transvascularly, which is also possible. The fistulas that we encounter, as I said, done by hysterectomies mostly, are high up in the vagina, and then you really have to, uh, to, to gain access to it in order to, uh, to close it. So what do we do for gaining access? Well, we need to have a retractor and traction sutures in order to, to, to pull the fistula out. For that, we need specula. I always use Jameson scissors. I'll show you a picture of it in a few uh, moments. We can do epiostomy EP in order to, uh, to have uh, more room to close the fistula. That's on the, uh, on the fornix posterior of the, uh, of the bladder, meaning the entrance of the vagina where it goes to the perineum. We always use blue dye in order to, uh, to check what we did. And afterwards, we leave a catheter or a sound. This is the Turner Warwick retractor. This is a very nice retractor because it has ver various features that you might use in closing fistula. For instance, the knots on the retractor, this one, can be used really to use traction sutures. So if you put a traction sutures like this and pull on the suture, the fistula, which is in the middle, might come out and then you have easier access to the fistula. And the knots can be used to really um, uh, tie the sutures that you need. We also have these clamps, which look very horrible, but finally they give you uh, a lot of strength in order to, uh, to have access to the fistula because you cannot operate 10 centimeters in the vagina. You have to pull the fistula out in order to have access. And in our cases, mostly after hysterectomy, that is easier because the uterus is already taken out. That was the reason for the fistula to occur. So the Turner Warwick Retractor is the one that we use um, very often, uh, always, and that is a major help for us in order to have access to the fistula. 
This is the Jameson scissors. If you look at the scissors, you can see that it is narrow and that it is sharp. That's another one that we normally use for dissection of tissue. This one really is capable of having very fine dissection, very sharp dissection um, in the area that is needed. And fistulas need very sharp and fine dissection in order to mobilize the tissue and have good uh, walls of the fistula that you can close. So the Jameson scissors is if one of the things that you really need in order to do fistula surgery. Then exposure of the fistula. You might question yourself, what is this? Where is the fistula? Is it here? Is it there? Or is it there? And that is not so obvious. The MRI Sorry. might give Sorry. you... Sorry to interrupt, John. I, I don't think we can see your mouse pointer, that, so just let you know. Do you see it now? Not at the moment. Oh, there we now? go. Yeah. Now, yeah, that's it. Cool. Okay, then I'll do it in, in this way. Sorry. Thank you. So this is, this is my mouse again. The question is, where is the fistula? Is it here? Is it there? Is it there? That is not that obvious. And the MRI that we made beforehand gives us an indication where it is. But from this picture and from this view, we cannot see it. So for that, you need blue dye. And if you look at the blue dye picture now, you can see this is a catheter filled with blue dye. And it's running uh, through the fistula here and there. So I think that the fistula is starting here and is running there. Perhaps this one is also very, uh, uh, can also be a fistula, but that's not very clear. And it really indicates that the blue dye will help you in finding the fistula, but also in, uh, in, in checking whether you close it or not. And we will see that in the video I made for you. Then we have to incise and dissect and mobilize the fistula. That can be done in various ways. I prefer the LATSCO, which is a circumferential incision around the fistula. You can use the J-shaped incision. I come with pictures in a few seconds. Or you can make a horizontal fistula at the fistula base, which is mainly done when you have a huge fistula with a big hole. This is the LATSCO incision. What you can see here, here is the fistula. And what you can do is um, circumferent with the knife, the fistula, and then you can develop the flaps of the uh, fistula wall. So this is a typical Dasco uh, incision. And then you can cut the fistula out if you want. I mostly don't do that, but if you want to do that, you can do that and you can develop the layers in order to close them very neatly. Here you can see how that is done. This is the wall of the fistula. This is the fistula inside. It's organized tissue. That means it will not close itself anymore. And then you have to uh, circumferent with knife or with the scissors uh, the fistula and develop the walls in order to close it. Typically, let's go incision. If you use the J-shaped incision, what you do is make an incision around the fistula, very close to it, and develop the flaps down and up in order uh, to have the second layer. What you see here is this is the fistula. This is the inside of the uh, anterior vaginal wall. So you're looking at the bladder tissue at this moment. That's the serosa or detrusor. The fistula is here. And you can imagine that if you develop this flap and also um, on, the, uh, on the upper part, then it's easier to close. What you can do is close the fistula easily with interrupted sutures. And then you close the flap like this um, uh, over the fistula. There's no connection between the fistula, which is closed at the bladder level, and the fistula that is closed at the anterior wall level. And that means that there's no connection between the two layers and to the, uh, the two uh, incised layers. And that makes the chance that the fistula will come back um, less. Horizontal incisions can be done at fistula base. You make the incision like this. And then you can develop a flap down and a flap up. You close the fistula and the layers come over it. What we mostly do is that we close in two layers. That means that we close the bladder layer and then we close the vaginal layer. You can put in something in between. We come to that later. Uh, and then uh, you might have a watertight closure of your fistula. That means that there will be no recurrent fistula. So this is how it is developed. 
the circumferent fistula again, a flap above. This is the serosa of the bladder or the detrusor. This is the urethelium, which going inside. So first you close this, and then you close the vaginal layer over it. For that, you need to enter wretched space, most likely, because you need the, the, the volume and, and uh, the room in order to have uh, the, the fistula pulled together and that the layers really can close. There should be no traction uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the layers that you close, otherwise it will uh, recur. And that means that you have to dissect more than you just uh, see when you see the fistula. Just closing the fistula will not help you. You have to develop um, the layers in order to be able to close them without traction. So closure of the fistula. Well, what I always do is I use absorbable sutures, monocryl, 3-0 or 4-0, sometimes even 5-0. Um, what you do is you make an inverted suture on the bladder layer and on the detrusor and serosa layer of the, of the bladder. You don't need to close the urethelium separately. That means that you don't need to have three layers, two is enough. And then uh, you can have a good uh, watertight closure of your bladder layer. This is what I mean with an invented suture. If you look at the anterior your vaginal wall and the bladder wall, we come from this side. This is the fistula, which you can see here. So you go in with the suture through the tissue. You come out with the suture before the fistula, go with the same suture over the fistula, go down again on the other side, come up again on the other side. And if you close it like this, then you can really see that the layers are closing inside the bladder. This is a real inverted suture. And if you do that, then you have a good deep layer already, and then the vaginal layer come uh, over that, that makes that you will uh, have a good chance of closing this fistula. Then we use for the single layers of the bladder, separate sutures, five millimeters apart. You have to avoid traction, that is very important. If you have traction, and that is often the case when you have radiated tissue, then the chances of Closing this fistula uh, are less. So if you can avoid traction, for that you have to dissect more than you perhaps want, uh, is important. You can use a master flap. It's optional. It, it is only used finally when patients have troubles like irradiation. Also, when there is some traction on your, on your deep layer, then the master flap might use you, uh, but um, uh, quite often it's not necessary. You can use supporting sutures, we come to that later, and then you have to check for a watertight closure. The famous line is that blue dye won't lie, so if you see blue dye after having closed your fistula, the fistula still is open and you have to go in again. Same surgery. This is a marshes flap. So you have the labium maeus, which is covered with fat, with fatty tissue, and it has vascularization um, from the pudendal uh, internal pudendal artery and it goes from under above so if you open the labium you can open the fatty tissue and the fat pad because the marcher flap is a fat pad and if you mobilize it you can put it over the fissure like this and then you can close it you can choose to uh, dissect from under up or from up to under that means that the flap here is on the uh, on the abdominal part, and that means that you are closer to the uh, to the fistula um, that you have to cover. You can also do that other way around. That doesn't make the difference. And what you can see here is that if you take a clamp, you take the fatty pet, uh, the fat uh, tissue from the master flap and um, pull the master flap into the vaginal wound, and then you can cover the fistula. This is also a picture from Professor de Ridder again. You can see that he uses blue dye here to close the fistula. This is the marcher flap. He dissected it from uh, bottom up. So uh, that means that he can use this flap in order to go inside laterally and then close the fistula with it. This is what you, uh, what you would like if you use a marcher flap and then you can close the wound again. Warn your patients that this might happen. So if you think you use a marcher flap, tell the patients that they will have an other appearance of their uh, uh, genital area because this will, um, this will change the configuration of the major levius. 
And that needs to be told because otherwise people are unhappily surprised after the surgery, although they are dry. Then there is continence and there is post-operative care. For continence, we choose to check with the, with the blue dye. Then we put in a catheter and that is left in place for about 10 to 14 days in our case. After 10 to 14 days, we make a cystography. So we fill the bladder with contrast material. We do x-rays and then we see whether there still is a fistula and also whether the patient voids empty after having filled the bladder. If that is, uh, if that is everything okay, then you can take out the catheter and then you can um, uh, have a happy patient. Once again, this is the algorithm that you can use. If you have a vesicle vaginal fissure like this, it can be primarily simple. And for that, perhaps you can even try a catheter for a couple of weeks, whether the fissure will close spontaneously. In my experience, that doesn't happen very often. And then you have the primary complex, recurrent cases, etc. And the further you go to the right here, the more difficult it gets. And for this, you really need uh, marches flaps or other things in order uh, finally to close the fistula. We will now look at the video. And I have to see whether we can start it. Yes. Can you see this, Darren? Is Here this... Can you see it? Um, no, no, it's, it's, it's part of the video. Yes, fine. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yep. Do you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'll go back a bit because this is. Okay. So, no, sorry. The story of this patient was that it is a woman of 50 years old. She had an abdominal hysterectomy in 2014. That was accompanied by a vesicle vaginal fistula. That was closed in 2015, vaginally. Six months later, there was recurrent incontinence and then there was no fistula seen. So the diagnosis was made that it would be stress urinary incontinence for which, for which uh, uh, pelvic floor muscle exercises were given. That was the fact that she was nearly dry. But then, a year later, she had recurrent urinary um, incontinence, and not only during the day, but also at night, and not extra with exercise. That, that is another clue. If patients have incontinence at night without having overactive bladder complaints, then you have to consider whether there's a fistula or not. Your dynamics were done, the free flow was okay, the volume voided was okay, and it was emptied, and there was stress incontinence. Okay, that means that more diagnostics were done, like urethrocystoscopy. There were no abnormalities seen, but the blue test, the blue dye test was positive, and, and that's a bad sign. MRI, MRI was done, there was no recurrent fistula visible, but still, when there was, uh, when the blue blood dye test is positive, there should be a fistula anyway. So the idea is that you have to continue like that. So now I'll show you the video of this very tiny fistula, um, easy to access, easy to close, but also that it can, uh, that it can uh, go wrong. So if you look here, well, you don't see that much. And I continue. But you can also see that here is something that is really blue. So this is the fistula and that is not easy to see. So what we do then is that we start circumcising. This was very, um, uh, very remote, very distally uh, of the bladder. So it was easy. Uh, to access, and I didn't have to use all the retractors that we normally do. This is how to excise the fistula tracts. So the fistula can clearly be seen here. It's a very tiny one, so easy to miss. 
And sometimes you even think, well, there is no fistula at all. And then we go with the Lasco technique and circumferent the fistula in order to develop the layers of the bladder and of the vaginal interior wall in order to close it. So this is done with the scissors already. So what you can see is that we use the scissors in order to uh, develop the, um, the layers. This is the traction sutures on the vaginal anterior wall. We are not there yet because we have to, uh, we have to develop more in order to really close it in an inverted way. And that means that we put traction sutures also um, on the um, posterior wall so that we really can see the uh, identification uh, of the fistula, the bladder layer, the opening of the fistula, and also the layer that is here. This is the bladder layer, this is the vaginal layer. So in this case, I excise the fistula tract, and then you have to decide whether this is enough tissue that you have developed in order to be able to make the inverted layer. And that's what we're going to test now. And I decided it was enough. So this is the first suture going in and out above the fistula that is somewhere here. And what you can see is that you really can invert the layers and that you can really um, have this inverted layer of tissue, which makes that the chances of closing it uh, are higher. This is monocule for zero. This is the second one going in and going in again. So this is before the fistula. The fistula is over here. So the next one will be on the other side and coming out again also on the other side. We always use RB needles because those are the smallest, which gives you the most, the best space in order to be able to, uh, to close it very deep. But it also has some limitations because it is not firm. Quite often it's not firm. So this, are, this is the layer. The first one is already uh, tight. So this one, this suture will be uh, closed also um, at this moment. And this is the deepest layer that we have to uh, close in order um, to have a good watertight closure of the uh, bladder layer. We continue one, two, three stitches here on the deeper layer, then we cut it. And then I decided that between these two stitches, there's too much room. This is not four millimeters, it's more. So we have to put an extra stitch. Okay, we do that. And then we do the blue dye test. This is closure of the fistula for um, uh, four sutures. And you can see that the blue dye is going into uh, the catheter soon. And because this is a demonstration, comes out very quickly also through the wound of the fistula. So this is the metal and blue test and what you can see is what you don't want to see, but for demonstration is good, something is not good. If you see something like this, don't bet on it that it will close itself, it will not. You have to go in again. And that makes that you have to develop more walls here in order to, uh, to have uh, more room and then you have to put uh, some extra stitches. So that is done here. You see there's an extra stitch. That means that there's more tissue that you that you bend and, and invert to the bladder wall, but uh, if you don't do that, you will not close it. So finally, we put two extra stitches. Like this, we close it, as you can see. Again, in an inverted way.
And then we do the blue dye test again. Here you see the blue dye in the catheter again. We test it, really fill the bladder. You have to use about 250 to 300 mils bladder filling. This lady had a urodynamic investigation just before, and so you must be able to, to, to fill it to that extent. And if you don't see, um, I'm sorry, if you don't see um, blue dye coming out of the wound, then you know that your deepest layer is closed. And then you have to do the second layer, which is the vaginal layer. Well, for that, I use, as we call it, Donati type of sutures. So going in and going out on the other side. And coming back again. And what you perhaps didn't see is that that this is an everted suture. So the rims of the uh, of the vaginal uh, wound are uh, pointing to the vaginal side and not to the bladder side in order to avoid contact uh, of the two. That's how you close the wound. And then finally, this is what you uh, what you have in the end. You tie everything cut it, and that's it. We leave the catheter for a couple of weeks, and then we are fine. So this is the, this was the first video of how to uh, close a vaginal fistula. This was a really easy one. It was a very small fistula. It was uh, easy to access. It was very uh, distal um, uh, in the vaginal wall, which was um, also uh, having some, some progress uh, problems, but still, if you don't do the blue dye test, you might be in trouble and uh, then you have to do it again, perhaps. So please do the blue dye test because that, that gives you a really clue whether you did something that is, uh, that is good. The second case is about vaginal mass that we sometimes encounter. This is very rare uh, to, to, uh, to my experience, at least. Uh, and then you ask yourself, how do I, I assess these kind of patients. This is the, the case, a woman of uh, 60, uh, 76 years old, um, or 67, sorry. She has complaints for two years and uh, she's known and referred to the uh, urologist and the gynecologist in a combined uh, meeting uh, since two months. She's on self-catheterization. Uh, that she does once a day, and then she catheterizes between 250 and 500 cc's. She voids 250 cc's, uh, and she has voiding difficulties the rest of the day. She also has complaints of nocturia, and uh, the complaints gets worse the last month. She doesn't suffer from urinary tract infection, so that's the good sign, of, that's a good part of it. But we do physical examination and urethrocystoscopy. Uh, there is no abnormalities in the urethra and the bladder, but there is a big, lumpy, round, soft, smooth mass between the urethra and the anterior vaginal wall. You can see that uh, with a physical examination. That was already uh, diagnosed in another hospital, and they biopsied this mass, and it appeared not to be uh, malignant. The MRI shows a mass with the origin between the urethra and the anterior vaginal wall with a huge protrusion in the bladder, and it's in the midline and solid. What is very good about this is that the ureteric orifices are lateral to the process, so they are separate. And it looks like a lyomyoma. Well, you know, all these know these lyomyomas, and they can also occur um, at vaginal level. This is the MRI. So this is the bladder, as you can see here. This is the pubic bone, and this is the huge mass that protrudes into the bladder and is also palpable um, vaginally. And if you see a picture like this, well, then you have to uh, question yourself, how should I access this? Should I go from above? Well, then it's easy to get to the top of this mass, but you, will, you might run into problems uh, distally, so where the, uh, where the mass is the deepest. You also are not very well known uh, with the ureteric uh, orifices here. You might try from uh, uh, from the vaginal side because it appears that the urethelium is still covering this mass and perhaps it has nothing to do with it. 
and you can keep the bladder intact. That's what we did. And I show you uh, the video now. Can you this, Darren? Yes, Is this one, video John, yeah. visible? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we continue. And this is how we uh, prepare the patients. Um, it is not that clear, is it? Okay, so what you can see here, I stopped the video for a moment, is that this is the bladder catheter. This is one of the ureter catheters that uh, was only possible to put it into the right ureter and not into the left ureter. We could not place that one. And this is the anterior vaginal wall. Does it look that bad? And perhaps it is, uh, the lump is somewhere here. Should be there because that's what the MRI shows us. But we continue. And then we shall start preparing this mass. We make an inverted U incision, as you can see here. And then we develop the mass, which is already a bit visible in this, in this picture. So what you can see is that we see the mass coming out. The bladder is here. It's easy to dissect. There is some fiber tissue. I think it's detrusive tissue on this mass. And with the Scott retractor in this case, you can have good access to this. And then, well, finally you hope for the best, but you have to be, um, Careful what you do, of course, and that mainly goes for the bladder. This part is the most difficult one. If you can make the separation between this mask and the ureterium or the detrusor, then you can spare the bladder and that makes that you don't have to do any reconstruction there. You can see it coming here. This really looks like well, let's say a myoma even, and it's a lyomyoma in this case. A bit further, then clearly you can palpate the mass, it's visible there, and this most likely is the endopelvic fascia and some bladder tissue, and what you really want to do is, is, is be very careful with the bladder. I put a stitch here to have some traction on this lyomyoma, so we know already that's not malignant, at least based on the biopsy gun that was used. And then you can develop it in a very easy way. You see? Now you can prepare it. And finally, the whole mass can be mobilized outside the vagina from the bladder, of the bladder, without big difficulties. Of course, we look whether we are in the bladder, where we see ureters, etc. But finally, that's not the case. So this is what we finally took out. And then you have to prepare what you can see very nicely here, the bladder from this mass. This is urethelium with edema from irritation or from traction or perhaps from the surgery. This will be the trusor, the red part, the gray part is urethelium. And then you have to separate the mass from the bladder area just by cutting it. 
So it's out now. And then we were looking and inspecting the posterior bladder wall, and then we saw that it was quite intact and that we didn't have damaged, we didn't damage the urethelium and also not the detrusor. So we left it in place, just close this, uh, close this mass in, in a simple way and left the catheter for a couple uh, of weeks and then took it out. So this is closure, straightforward closure with a running suture, Donati type still. Again, I like that one because it gives nice edges um, uh, inside the, vaginally, uh, the vagina and not in the, um, at the bladder layer. Okay, that was the mass, which was, well, I think, impressive. Four weeks post-operatively, um, it appeared to be a leiomyoma indeed. No malignant um, uh, features in it. It was seven centimeters in size. And she was fine. She was not incontinent. There were no urinary tract infections. She avoided empty and didn't need to do self catheterization. One year later, she developed some moderate size incontinence for which she got a tape. But to my surprise, this was also uh, very nicely solved. Indication of an example that you can uh, do vaginal surgery also for huge masks and you, that you don't have to do a deleterious um, surgery from the abdominal side with more work, more scar tissue, and perhaps not even that good result. Now, this is a difficult topic, urethral diverticula. The ones of you who know this, who see it, uh, know that it can recur, that the symptoms are very diverse and that uh, it doesn't occur that often. Um, one of this, uh, these materials is, is given to me by George Cashin. He's a friend of ours and a professor of urology in Moscow. And he sees this, um, well, apparently uh, also quite frequently. Well, what do you know? What do we know about periurethral mass? Well, it, it was already mentioned in 1575. And for surgical treatment, the first report was done in 1805. So that's more than 200 years ago. It's still a rare condition. And if you look into the literature, it's about a half to 7% um, of uh, incidence, what you see. Um, based on diagnostics, perhaps now the incidence rates are higher because we, are, uh, we can clearly see them uh, with better um, the visual age that we have at the moment. And they mostly occur uh, about uh, around 30 years of age. The etiology is unknown, but this is the explanation by Skene, the famous uh, one of the glands of Skene. He says, well, if we have all these uh, periurethral glands uh, that, you, that, that work as a kind of a lubricant of the urethra, it can get inflamed and get obstructed, like you uh, see here, then it can um, uh, develop into an abscess, which can expand back to the urethra in another, in another way. And then you have the typical uh, configuration of your um, bulb at the urethral site, which is painful and also um, can uh, cause infections. What do we see? We see bulk, we see vaginal discomfort, urinary symptoms, cosmetic does look very nice. It is infected quite often, and sometimes it can uh, um, um, have stones or cancers in it. And then, of course, that's another situation. The real thing is that the symptoms are very diverse. If you look at what's already mentioned in the literature as symptomatic for urethral diverticula, this is it. It can be a vaginal or pelvic mass. It can cause pelvic pain. There can be urethral pain. It can cause dysuria, frequency, post void dribbling, dyspareunia, urgency, incontinence, hesitancy, discharge, double voiding, etc., etc., etc. What is very typical is expression of urethral discharge uh, with stripping of the anterior vaginal wall. Well, that's not quite often the case, but the expression of discharge is quite, uh, uh, quite a typical uh, symptom of a urethral diverticulum. Well, if you don't uh, have the diagnosis 
in the beginning and you have other symptoms, then of course the treatments that are given before they are referred because of the urethral diverticular can also be very diverse. It can be treated with chronic, uh, like chronic cystic uh, trigenitis with antibiotics, or it can be treated like being stress incontinence, and then you have anti incontinence surgery or urge incontinence treated with anticholinergic, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even it's sometimes called psychosomatic disorder because no one can find anything, and then you even get physiotherapy for urethral diverticulum. That should not be the case. Physical examination, what we see, the vaginal wall tenderness and a palpable mass. This is typically a mass that could be urethral diverticulum. If you press this uh, bulb, then you can have expression of purulence and blood uh, via the meatus, and that should be cultured. And if it's too firm, you should be care, uh, careful not to uh, dealing with a stone or with a neoplasm. Well, there are many um, types of these urethral bulbs. It can look like this, or like this, or like this, or like this. I think this is quite typical. This is exceptional, and this is also very exceptional. So this is mainly what you see and what you can palpate. What do we do? Well, you can do cystoscopy. But then you have to use a, a short cystoscope or urethroscope with a 30 angle lens. You compress the anterior vaginal wall like it's, like it's done here. And then you want to see the excavation of this urethral diverticulum. And more than 50% of the orifices of this diverticulum is in the mid ureter, So you can look there. If you don't see it, it doesn't mean that someone doesn't have in your regional diverticulum because you can miss it very easily especially when the, uh, the neck is very narrow you can use sonography um, transvaginally um, or transperineally or, or transrectally or even with color doppler that also gives an indication of something that could be sorry your diverticulum or you can use the famous double balloon catheter there's one catheter uh, double balloon, uh, one balloon is in the bladder, one is expressed to the meatus, and then there's holes in this catheter that can um, that can give you some, some fluid or even contrast, and then you can diagnose uh, the diverticulum. We don't use these catheters anymore since we have uh, uh, MRI, uh, which is a very, uh, uh, very better way of um, visualization of this urethral diverticulum. You can do it even with uh, IVU if you have it. You can see the diverticulum here. Or here, that's a diverticulum, or here. But what you don't see in this case is how extensive this diverticulum is. But that you need MRI. Um, can be done in, 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 a, in a very easy way. And I show you some examples. You don't need endorectal or vaginal coils, but you can do it. And the MRI has a higher sensitivity and a better characterization. It's, you can better look at the size, at the location, the complexity of the urethral diverticulum compared to all the other investigative tools that we have. So for instance, this was a lady of 50 years. She had complaints in four years of urinary tract infections, frequency, discharge, post void dribble, especially the discharge and the UTIs in combination should be um, uh, suspicious of having urethral diverticular. What you see here is the rectum, vagina, this is the MRI, this is the urethra, and this is the diverticulum. It is more than horseshoe shoe shaped. It is circumferencing the urethra completely. And this is from the sagittal view. This is the bladder. This is the pubic bone, vagina, rectum, and here you see the diverticulum. Another one, lady 41 years old, since two years she has complaints, pain at urethra, UTI, and post for dribble. And what you can see here, that this is a real classical horseshoe-shaped urethral diverticulum circumferencing the urethra. And what is not good in this case, and in all the cases, is that this is also at the very uh, spot of the urethral sphincter. So if you take out 
this diverticulum, you will damage the sphincter. And the way you should treat it is that you have to try to uh, take the urethral diverticulum completely out with the surgery and avoid the sphincter in order to keep them uh, continent. And that's not very easy. This is the same lady. This is the diverticulum, as you can see it here. This is the bladder and the pubic bone for orientation. And now I show you a video from George Cashin that is um, that is showing how they uh, how they do it in Moscow. And I. So can you see the video? Is it running? You can see it, John, yeah. Is it running? I think you need to press play on it again. Let's see what's happening. Might be a bit slow. It's slow, yeah. Um... Well, this is, this is okay. This is not a very long. Do you see it there, Darren? We can see it. We can start, see it, but yeah, it's not moving at all. So it's not moving. Okay. No. Uh, let me see. How can I? So you don't see it, huh? It keeps updating itself very every time you click on it, it updates itself, but it's not flowing and such. It does on, on my screen. Okay. Okay. I go I try one back. You see the message video as 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 I don't know what that means. It means that that it should uh, play. It means play, but ah. it doesn't work. Um, well, I'm. I'm sorry for this because no. Uh, okay, what shall I do, Darren? Because I don't think I can. So we can see it kind of update every so often. I don't know whether you can just um, find. I don't know what you're seeing. You're probably seeing different to what I'm seeing, always seeing. So yeah, you 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 see the the the, the still now. It's still now, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think I have to skip this. I'm sorry for that, but I, I cannot mend it at the moment, I think. Mm -hmm. Now back to the... Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry for that. You have to... Uh, you have to um, I'll look at, at the, the, the file again, perhaps uh, after the presentation to, to, to see it running. The, the, the urethral diverticulum issue is that uh, you have to take it out completely. That means that you have to develop the edges around uh, the urethra. Also, not only the outside, so the outside edge of the uh, and wall of the diverticulum, but also the inside wall that is closer to the urethra. Uh, for that, you have to open the urethra in order to take it out completely and then close it again. Try to, uh, um, uh, to restore the urethral sphincter and, um, uh, and make as less damage to the sphincter as possible, if that's possible, because you don't have the clear view uh, quite often. 
and then it will um, it can it can be okay. So this lady that we saw for 50 years, uh, one year after the surgery, she still had some pain of the urethra, and that's what you quite often uh, see that patients after surgery still have urethral pains. Uh, you can also see that there is still some remnant of the um, uh, of the diverticulum left. Uh, she was not incontinent, and um, she didn't want to go for surgery uh, in this case. The lady, after uh, of 40 years, one, this is six months postoperatively, she still had pain and discharge, not incontinent, but this was too much. And we, we treated her with antibiotics first. And then uh, finally, uh, this was the view one year later, so post op, and then there was no pain, no incontinence anymore. She developed complaints afterwards. I had to do the surgery on her again uh, and taking everything out. And then she also needed surgery for incontinence. So you can take it out, but then the, the, the price of that is that you damage the closing system of the bladder. So take home messages for this, and I'm sorry that we couldn't uh, look at the video, is that um, the diverticular, uh, they are rare and challenging because you have to take everything out and you have to spare the sphincter. Um, you can do vaginal approaches for any case, especially for the urethral diverticular, but also for, for big lumps. Um, you have to prepare for urethral reconstruction. So if you open the urethra, you have to close it again. That means that you have to do it in such a way with uh, not running sutures, uh, with stay sutures uh, in order to, uh, to have no narrowing and strictures of the urethra. MRIs are best for diagnostics uh, of urethral diverticular, but also for the fistulas that we saw. Um, if you have to do uh, incontinent surgery, you can do it at the same time. I prefer always to do it not at the same time because uh, you, the outcome is quite often surprisingly good and you have to watch for malignancy in, in very rare cases. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. Thank you, John. Yeah, if anyone wants to ask a question, please uh, type it in and I'll uh, pass it on. Okay. What we can maybe do with the video, John, is see if we could upload it separately. Yeah. Um, Ron, if we can maybe get you to talk over it, possibly, and do that um, yeah. in a few days or weeks before we do that. Must be apologies to people. So it's just big files and struggling a little bit. Um, you want to do that now? Sorry. You want to do that now? No, no. So we'll do we'll do that afterwards. So we'll try and do that. As, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So no questions um, at the moment. Let's give people a bit to type in. So. I see your question that you couldn't see the pointer. That was just for the first couple of slides, but well, that's why I, I mentioned it uh, directly. So <laughs> okay, but it's fine after that. Yeah. So while we're waiting, if anyone's got any questions, please do ask. If anybody thinks of anything afterwards, please, you'll have my email address as the contact uh, through um, uh, all the information I'll be sending out, um, a link to the video of this afterwards as well. Um, so if you think of any questions afterwards, please don't hesitate to send them on to me and I'll pass them on uh, to John and get your response. Um, yeah, and also remember to check out uh, our Eurogen website and follow us on Twitter as well, because we'll advertise future webinars on there as well, um, as well as on Facebook. And what else are we doing these days? I think um, possibly Instagram as well. So uh, we can find us on all those channels. Okay. I think if, if there are no questions, and I don't see any, do you see any, Darren? Uh, not at the moment, no, no. So I'll give people one more minute. <laughs> we'll, um, okay. we'll, we'll bring it if there's anything. So, um, yeah. So, um, uh, so the video we're really calling will be available afterwards. We'll do our best to try and sort out something with that video, um, so people, so you can possibly, hopefully, watch it with John's commentary. Um, it'll be a separate video file, um, but we'll try and get it onto one of our um, our go-to channel, um, which will be slightly different to the web go-to webinar. But uh, we'll. Um, but I'll send out. I'll send out. If we manage to do that, I'll send out an explanation, explanatory email to everybody, uh, explaining how to how to watch it. Um, 
So a lot of thank you very much from Pascal Haj, thank you. Um, yeah, okay, so I think um, we'll leave it there. Um, so if anything wants to email me afterwards, please do to contact me with any questions or anything like that. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for attending. Um, and uh, we'll hopefully see some, uh, some of you can join for future webinars. Um, I can't remember the top of my head. We haven't got a title for the next one next month, but there will be one in July. Um, so thanks very much, everybody. Uh, take care all. And thank you again, John, for, for that. So much appreciated. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Have a nice evening. Yeah, I have to try and end this. <laughs>